Hi, welcome to Inside Church. We trust that the Lord would minister to your heart and that faith would be built as you listen to the message. Can we just bless our team? Amen. All right, if you were here um, last week, we're going to carry on um, or pick up from where we went off last week. And so if you go with me in your Bibles, we're going to start in Romans chapter 5. And we're going to look at verse 12, Romans chapter 5, verse 12. Just a bit of a recap. Last week we spoke about, or we started in the Garden of Eden. We started with Adam and we started with Eve. And we looked at how God's original design for mankind, that's you and I, if you don't know, um, is that there would be nothing missing and that there would be nothing broken. Adam and Eve made in the image of God were made perfect in the realm of their spirit, in the realm of their soul, in the realm of their body. There was absolute perfection. Again, there was nothing missing and there was nothing broken. There was no sickness in the garden. There was no anxiety in the garden. There was no fear in the garden. There was no condemnation in the garden. All these things that irritate us in this life, that trip us up in this life, didn't exist with Adam and with Eve. And it wasn't just for Adam and Eve that God, God didn't say, okay, this is for Adam and Eve and the rest of you, you know, you just, let me just change the script. I'll write a different story for you. By him doing it for Adam and Eve, he shows his intent that it was for all of us. And what we have to understand, and it's like we really have to get this, is that his intent hasn't changed. You know, I think Pastor Craig said this morning, God doesn't change, or he said last week, God doesn't change his mind. You know, even there's a scripture that says, God's not a man that who should lie, one who changes his mind. Because he doesn't say, oh, yuck, it didn't work out for Adam and Eve. Let me just change now and say, okay, let's compromise the human race. Let's compromise my, my children. And let's just say, okay, you can have a little bit of sickness or you can have a little bit of fear and you can have a little bit of anxiety. And then when Jesus comes again and he creates a new heaven and a new earth, then we'll go back to the garden. That's not, well, that's not God. His will for each one of us now, as you sit here tonight, whatever's going on in your body, whatever's going on in your spirit, man, whatever's going on in your soul, His desire and the will of God for you is that there would be nothing missing and that there would be nothing broken. And so when we read Romans chapter 5, verse 12, we see how all of this stuff came into being. And it says this, therefore just as sin came into the world through one man, talking about Adam, talking about the Garden of Eden when they ate of the tree of, de- uh, what, tree of good and evil, it says, and death through sin, so death spread to all men because all sinned. And so when Adam sinned, when Eve sinned, death came in through their sin. It's like, Sin opened the door, basically, if you can picture it that way. Sin standing at the door, and he opened the door, and he said, hey, death, come inside. And he, death came in, and like a virus, like a cancer, he began to spread through every faculty of humankind, every faculty of Adam, every faculty of Eve, and of the generations that would come from them, that this virus of death now infiltrates with mankind, where today we eat of the fruit of Adam's disobedience. You know, we have sickness in our bodies, as irritating as it is, like you don't even have to, you don't even have to look for sickness. It shall find thee, you know. Fear, anxiety, stress, you don't go looking for it, it comes to you. Why? Because it's in the world. Death is in the world. But that's not God's intention for us. And we see this, we looked at Isaiah 53, which we're going to do again, that God's intention is to bring us back to the, to the garden. Like I said, not in a future tense reality, but a present tense reality now. That you and I get to walk in the fullness of what Adam and Eve walked in in the garden. And that might sound like far-fetched. You might like, oh Lord, you're watching too much Star Wars, or you're watching you know, all these weird things. How can you say that we should not have any sickness? How can you say that we should not have any fear? How can you say that we should not have any anxiety? It's, it's almost non-reality. But guess what? I didn't say it. He said it. And we know we don't have to, people make this mistake, 
when they don't understand something in the Word, they push it aside. I love it in Hebrews 11, it says, by faith we understand. Let it come here first, then it'll come here. It's not the other way around. And so even when we don't understand, even when something seems so far, yes, Lord, do you really want me to live a life free from sickness? You mean this allergy that I get every year when it comes to spring, that I don't have to partake of that? Yes. Because that's what the Word says. I don't have to understand how it works. I just have to know what He says. And so sin was the cancer, the cross was the cure. Sin was the cancer, it, 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 it brought in death, it spread to all of mankind. But in the middle of, of the middle of the timeline of mankind, Jesus puts up this cross and He says, no more. It reminds you of that scripture where it says, when the enemy comes in like a flood, the Spirit of God raises up a standard against him. And this, the, the standard that the, that the Father raised up against death against the enemy, against this, this virus, this cancer of death. He raises up the standard. He, he lifts up the cross. He lifts up Jesus on that cross and He says, no more. It stops here. And I love that when Jesus, at the very end of the cross, when He's, he's finished His crucifixion, He says, it is finished. Speaking of the, uh, of the condemnation of man, all these plagues that came upon mankind, he took, the, the Bible talks about, he took everything upon his body. He took all our sin, all our shame, all our guilt, all our fear, all our anxiety, all our sickness. He took that upon his body and he came into agreement with the Father and he said, it stops now. And we get to, to, to transition or to live our lives from the cross. That's what I love about being born again is you, get, you, you start at the cross. Yeah. That's what being born again is. You got born again at the cross. Yeah. And so everything that Jesus achieved at the cross, the full reality of it is finished, I get to live my life from what happened at that point in time. I don't have to undergo all the sufferings and all these things that happened before the cross. The cross is the reality of the believer. The cross is the reality of the life that we get to live as believers in God. And so we all, I love Pastor Graham, talking about back to basics, back to the cross. You never graduate from the cross. I think we, we, we do that too quickly sometimes. You know, we, oh, I got the cross now. Let me move on to the deeper things or the greater things. But there's nothing great. If you just had to sit at the cross and meditate on that for a whole year, it'll just, it'll blow your world. And so we're going back to the cross. So in Isaiah chapter 53, we read it last week, but we'll read it again. Isaiah chapter 53 says this. Verse 45, surely He has borne our griefs. You remember that word griefs means anxiety. And carried our sorrows, talking about pain, mental pain, talking about depression. Then it says, yet we esteemed Him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon Him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with His wounds we are healed. And so sin was the cancer, but the cross was the cure. And so we see every area of man that was afflicted by Adam's disobedience, the spirit, the soul, and the body, every area of our lives has been redeemed by the cross. And so Jesus didn't just die for us to go to heaven. He died that we would be physically and mentally whole as well. I say again, He didn't just die for us to go to heaven. He also died that we would be physically and mentally whole. The word saved, saved in the Bible, it's a word so, so, and it literally means, it means saved, healed, and delivered. I got irritated one time. I, was, I don't know whether I was reading something because I like to do research, obviously, and this guy, he took Isaiah 53 and he took verse five and he says, 
And with his wounds, we are healed. And he says, that's not talking about physical healing. It's talking about the healing of the spirit, man. It's just like, you know, it's like the lengths people go to deny, I don't, and I don't even know why. It's like, you know, I, I want to meet one of these people one day and I want to find them when they're sick. And I'm going to follow them to the doctor. And I'm saying, why are you going to the doctor? You are disobeying God. You're going against the will of God by getting medicine for your ailment. If God wants you to be sick, if it's His will for you to be sick, then why are you taking medicine? You know, because it's so stupid. It's like, you know, and we, we got, it's this religious nonsense picture that we just hold on to our tickets, you know, waiting for the bus to go to heaven and like we just suffer through life. You know, this sickness comes, I heard this not too far long ago. If sickness comes, that's the will of God for your life. Faith is a violation of the will of God. If God wants you to be sick, God wants you to be poor, stay poor. It's like, uh. you know, and, oh, shit. <laughs> And we misunderstand and we misconstrue Scripture, right? We look at but Paul talks about the sufferings of Christ and you talked about the thorn in his flesh and some guys will say, yeah, the sufferings of Christ. Talk about how God uses sickness to teach us a lesson and, you know, he uses brokenness and he uses, and he takes, and he, what, the Lord gives and the Lord takes away and he's gonna take away your wife and he's gonna take away your children and he's gonna take away all your finances just to show you that he loves you and he wants to teach you a lesson. This is like, it's absolute... And we sit there, or not us, praise God. Oh. But the church sits there and they say, yeah, shucks, eh? That's a... And we just take it all in. But it's, it's I just want to, <laughs> I just want us to get it. That's not God's will. It's not God's will for our lives. You know, the Bible talks about two or three witnesses confirming I want to go back to Romans chapter 5 and we're going to confirm what we just said. Romans chapter 5, verse 18. So again, referencing Adam, right, and his sin. It says, Therefore, as one trespass led to condemnation for all men, so one act of righteousness leads to justification. Listen to this. Justification and life. What is justification? Just as if I never sinned, right? It's the standing before God. He washes me clean by the blood. I'm forgiven of my sin. I stand before Him guiltless. I stand before Him righteous. What is that area concerning? That is concerning the spirit of a man. But listen to what Paul writes in Romans 5. He says, it leads Jesus' act on the cross his crucifixion, his death, his resurrection, and his ascension. It speaks to the justification of man. But then he says this, and life. That word life there is the word zoe. If you don't know what that means, zoe life, it talks about the spiritual and the physical life of God. It talks about this, it's the absolute fullness of life that comes from God. Another one says this, it's the state of one who is possessed of vitality. So again, it's the, it's the absolute form, it's like, you've got like a Pringles can, right? And they, you cram all the Pringles and you can't get any more in. Like you, you put the lid on, you can't close the lid. That's what he's talking about. Pringles, is, I don't know why Pringles is. I say weird stuff, but it's just like the first thing that comes to my mind. So. I just go for it, yeah. Maybe it's a word of knowledge and some <laughs> someone's got a Pringles addiction. So you have wine, you, you want to eat the whole thing. <laughs> but it's like, if you imagine a container and, and you're trying to fill it up and you can't put the lid on, that's the life that he's talking about. It's, it's the fullness of life. It's not just get, a bar, just get by, you know, just get along with life. It's, it's, it's His will and His desire for us is that we would experience the fullness 
of His life in every area, spiritually, socially, mentally, physically, and financially. God has no pleasure in our lack. The Bible says He takes pleasure in what? The prosperity of His saints. He takes pleasure when we walk in the fullness of life. Like as a parent, if you're a parent, and I'm sure you can imagine this even if you're not a parent, you're not happy when your child can't get something. Like you don't have money to buy your child something or your child is sick or your child is fearful or your child is crying. No sane parent takes pleasure in that and says, oh, this is lovely. Look how she's crying because she doesn't have any food to eat. That's, but we put that on God. Yeah. And we think, no, God just wants me to suffer. I'm, just, I'm standing with Paul. I mean, enduring the sufferings of Christ. It's rubbish. Another one, another witness. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 3. It's talking about Jesus, His divine power has granted to us all things, here it is again, pertaining to life and godliness. Again, that word life there is the word zoe. Life and godliness. The body, the soul, the finances, the relationships, and justification and righteousness. There's so much more to being saved than just being holy, than just being washed by the blood, than just being righteous. There's so much more. God just speaks to us and He says, Come up, come up higher. And so I wrote this in my notes through this one single act, talking about Jesus on the cross, through this one single act, everything that man for thousands of generations could ever need was provided for. Read again, through this one single act, everything that man for thousands of generations could ever need was provided for. I love this scripture in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 14 says, this, for by a single offering, he has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. And so one act of the cross, one moment of Jesus' death and his resurrection isn't the, the gospel, the good news. One moment of that is enough. And you can think like how many, I don't know, how many billions of people there are on the earth now and how many billions of people have been on the earth up until this point and how many more are still to come. And you just look at your own life and you can list, you know, I get this pain and I get this sickness and I struggle with this fear and I struggle with this anxiety and you got to list of at least 10 things, right? And so here we're sitting time, and maybe there's 150 of us. So there are 150 times 10, that's 1,500 issues here alone in this room. But yet the cross was enough for everything. Everything you would ever encounter in your life, any sickness, would, and regardless of the, like when COVID came, COVID was dealt with on the cross. You know, he's not unsurprised in like next year, or not prophesying, you know, they'll come up with something else. Monkey, what? Monkey pox, what the heck? <laughs> Could have thought of a better name. <laughs> you know, monkey pox, it's like we think, oh, that's a new thing. Guess what? He's already made provision for it on the cross. Whatever you will encounter in life, provision has already been made for you to overcome. Provision has already been made for you to walk in the fullness, to walk in the identity, in the perfection of Adam and Eve. Regardless of what it is, regardless of you know, who, whoever says how intense, or who, you can catch that one, um, if it says how intense that thing is, it doesn't matter to Jesus. Everything that you will face in life, every fear, every anxiety, every challenge, every stress, every moment of uncertainty, He's already made provision for it. He said, by this one, I'll read again verse, Hebrews 10 verse 14, for by a single offering, talking about Himself on the cross, He has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. 
You cannot add to the cross because you don't need to add to the cross. He doesn't have to come. It's like, oh, you know, I ran out. The, the power of the cross ran out. And so he's got to come again and do it again. He doesn't, it's just, it's enough for everybody forever. The next thing we need to understand about the cross, about Jesus' death, his resurrection, and his ascension is that it's good news. If you don't know the word gospel in the Greek actually means good news. And so the gospel is not it's not a it's not a it's not a message of affliction, it's not a message of sorrow. You know, it's a message of good news, it's a message of light. Jesus is the hope of glory, he is the light to the nations. And so the message of the cross, the message of the gospel is a message of victory. If we stay in Romans chapter 5. In verse 17, it says this. This is my favourite scripture. Romans chapter 5, verse 17 says, For if because of one man's trespass, death reigned through that one man, again talking about Adam, what we've been talking about, listen to this, much more will those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Christ Jesus. I read again, reign in life through the one man, and says that Jesus Christ. That word reign, it means us to be king. It means to rule over, it means to exercise dominion. And you've got to think of the context, when Romans was written, there wasn't a democracy, there was an autocracy, there was a king. And what the king said is what happened. And if you didn't do what the king said, it's what? Off with your head, right? Even remember those stories? And so the king, when you are king, you are not subject to anybody. You're not subject to anything other than God. And so when it says we reign in life, it says we get to be kings in life. In other words, we are not subject to this virus, this cancer of death that's circulating around in the world because that's, that's the thought pattern of the world. That's the thought pattern of the unrenewed mind is that I am a victim to sickness. I am a victim to anxiety. I'm a victim to depression. I'm a victim to, to stress. These things are, re, we say they are realities and Lord, you're being absurd to think that they cannot afflict me. I'm not saying that they're not going to try, but what I'm saying is that greater is He that is in you than he that is in the world. You are not subject. This is, this is, the, this is the, the reality of the power of being born again, of living from the cross, is that you don't have to be subject to what everyone else is subject to. You get to reign. You get to be king. And so when the flu comes your way, you say, flu, go the other way. It's subject, this is a reality. It is subject to you. Your body is not subject to it. Though a thousand may fall at my side, 10,000 at my right hand, it shall not come near you. It shall not come near me. Why? Because I am master over it. Not because of who I am, but because of what Jesus did on the cross. In Colossians chapter 2, we're talking about the victory, the good news of the cross. Colossians chapter 2, verse 15. says, He disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him. Other translations say the cross. The New Living Translation says this in this way he disarmed the spiritual rulers and authorities. He shamed them publicly by his victory over them on the cross. And so there's no mountain, there's no fight, there's no challenge that you'll ever face during your time on this earth that hasn't already been dealt with at the cross. There is no Satan, there is no sickness, and there is no bondage of sin that should overcome the believer. But how many of us walk here? Because this should 
be our reality. Ephesians chapter one, it talks about, again, the good news, Jesus' death, His resurrection, His ascension, referencing that. He says, He raised Him far above all rule, all authority, all power, all dominions, rulers of this age and of the age to come. And then going to Ephesians chapter two, and it talks about how He raised us up with Him, with Christ, and seated us with Him in the heavenly places. Where are we? Seated with Christ above, Ephesians 1, above all rule, all authority, or power, or dominion, rulers of this age and of the age to come. See, Jesus' victory on the cross is our victory. When Jesus made a public spectacle of the enemy triumphing over him through the cross, when he defeated all the powers of dark, he didn't do it for himself. Did you know that? <laughs> It wasn't his personal duel. He didn't go to the cross. He went to the cross for us. He didn't, he he is, he gains, I don't say nothing, but like it wasn't a joy for him. It was a joy set before him. After the cross, he endured. It was, if you look at the Garden of Gethsemane, it was a place of suffering. It was a place of intense sacrifice. It was not pleasurable for him, but yet he did it for us. He gained victory on our behalf because knowing we, like Adam, couldn't do it. Now we criticize Adam. Oh, Adam, you idiot, you ate the apple. When I get to heaven, I'm gonna beat you up. (laughs) You are Adam. (laughs) Yeah, we eat our apples every day. We go to spa, we buy a bag of apples and we eat it. We cannot overcome the enemy. But Jesus did it on the cross. His victory is our victory. The provision He made, everything He did on the cross was for us to live in victory. And so now we are seated with Him in heavenly places, far above all rule, all authority, and all power. And so here's this thing, right? We have everything in the cross. We have all provision. We have all victory. Yet for a large majority of Christians, we still live in defeat and we accept brokenness as the norm. I'll say it again. We have every, and I hope you've seen that, we have everything in the cross. Every, 2 Peter 1 verse 3, everything, that word everything means? Everything, <laughs> right? 2 Peter 1 verse 3, everything pertaining to life and godliness has been provided through the cross. Yet a large majority of Christians don't live there. We still live in defeat and we accept brokenness as the norm. I heard someone say this, it's like having a million dollars in the bank yet sitting at home and starving. It's all laid up. your, Your inheritance is life in abundance to the full till it overflows. That is in your bank account. Now, if you had to go, beep, balance, life. If you've got a million dollars in your bank account, but yet we sit at home and we starve. First of all, maybe we don't know that it's there. Or secondly, we don't actually fully believe that it's true. Right, you hear that phrase, too good to be true. And so in Romans chapter 12, verse two, we know the scripture well. Let me read it. It says, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. And so, If I don't believe that the fullness of life is God's will for me, I won't go go withdraw from that bank account. Yes, Lord, I see see the million dollars, right? I see the promises of God, but I believe that they are not for me because I believe that you are teaching me a lesson 
through my sickness. You are teaching me a lesson through my misfortune. I'm enduring the sufferings of Christ to be conformed to his image. So thank you for the million dollars, but I say no. And so we need to renew our mind. Like I said earlier on, this can sound very far out. I remember, <laughs> um, not to sing my family, but uh, not but My mom's from a Methodist, Methodist church, right? She grew up very Methodist. And so at that stage, she was still staying in the Free States. And my older brother came to Durban. And Pastor Dave and Sandy, you saw them here this morning. They were pastoring the church at that time and they were preaching the word of faith. And so my brother got saved under the word of faith message. And so he learned that because he suffered from asthma as a child, he learned that he doesn't have to have asthma anymore. So he went and he told it to my mom. He's like, you're going to a cult. <laughs> Why? Because the, mind, the unrenewed mind can't, it says, it can't approve, it can't discern what the will of God is. And what is that? That's just wrong teaching on behalf, not knocking the Methodist church, but it's wrong teaching. Where they were taught, you know, the sufferings of Christ are sickness. And so now you're telling me that you don't have to have asthma, you don't have to be sick. They scream out and say, that's a cult. You know, she's not there anymore, praise the Lord. She's very much on board with what we have. <laughs> So what I wanted to say is this, is that every challenge we face in life must be judged. It must be thought through from what has already been achieved through the cross. It should be the first point of reference. And so if you, let's say you have pain in your body and you go to the doctor and he diagnoses you with some kind of sickness, the first thing that goes through your mind should be the cross. Remember, we are born again from the cross. Our life emanates from the cross. And so we need to, in our thinking, get that as a reality. So whatever I face in life, I start thinking from the cross. And so I don't get diagnosed with a sickness and then I start thinking, okay, I've got to take this medication. I've got to do that. I've got to stop doing that. I've got to start doing this. The first thing that comes to, comes to my mind should be, the cross, that on the cross, He heals all my diseases. He's, by His stripes, I am healed. And so that becomes my perspective by which I now see this diagnosis or I see this issue or I see this problem. And so I start walking out what the cross says rather than what the world says. That's what we're saying, do not be conformed to the world. And so my mind is renewed to the will, uh, to discern and to prove the will of God. I know because of the cross, I have a revelation that through the cross of Jesus Christ, He came and He gave me life in abundance to the full until it overflows. That sickness is not my portion. Lack is not my portion. Disease is not my portion. Pain is not my portion. And so that is the glasses that I put on when I look at this issue. And I approach it as such. I don't now come from the other way around and I got this issue and I got all these things and I'm doing all these things and I try to work my way to victory. Victory has already been attained. I work from victory, not to victory. That's like a load off the shoulders. You don't have to fight and do all these things to try. Guess what? You don't have to fight for healing. You've already been healed. You don't have to fight for peace. You've already been given peace. It's just like you've got to, it's like the renewing of the mind. It's got to flip it around. It's got to think differently. Everything that you need in life has already been provided through the cross. This is redeemed thinking. It's thinking from the cross. It's, it's living from the cross. And like it says in Romans chapter 12, it says, do not be conformed to this world. And the world, they'll tell you, your, your grandmother had high blood pressure. So now your mom's got high blood pressure. And that's why you've got high blood pressure. Now I remember this one growing up, I don't even know if it's true. They say, if your grandparents had cancer, it skips your parents and it comes to the second, 
second, second generation. And so the second, it perpetuates in the second generation. What about this one? You're getting old now, so it's normal for you to have pain. I remember praying for a lady once. She was a co-worker at the time where I was working. And she had just turned 50, I think like the week before or the day before, something like that. And she came to work and she had pain in her knee. And so I was like, oh, I'm going to pray for you to be healed. So I'm praying. And then while I'm praying, I just, I feel to ask her, did you, did you have a thought in your mind that it's okay for you to have pain now because you're getting older? It's just like, obviously it was the Holy Spirit. She's like, yeah, actually last night, I was thinking to myself, yeah, I'm getting old now. I should start expecting pain in my body. And she woke up the next morning with pain in her knee. That, what is that? That's conforming to the world. That's not conforming to Scripture. Nowhere does it say that in the Bible, that the second generation gets cancer. Show me where that is. What's it like? The NLT, the New Lloyd Translations. <laughs> What's that guy, Joseph? Not Joseph. Smith, whatever, the guy who writes his own Bible and writes his own nonsense. Joseph Smith, there we go. You're Mormons. And there's a visitation from an angel and writes this nonsense. You know, the, 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 the thinking of the world is not found in the thinking of God. And God has revealed His thoughts very clearly of how He thinks we should live this life. And so we need to think like God thinks and we need to live like He says we should live and which is living from the cross, living in victory, living in life in abundance to the full and so overflow. I don't know if you guys have heard the statement, hulle weet nie wat ons weet nie. Trikus duplessie, right? You follow sports, the UFC guide, also the Springboks, right? It's like an African saying, if hopefully you know that because you're a South African. Um, but it's talking about the edge that we have as South Africans, like, you know, like that springbok mentality to win by one point, to win by one point, you know. And it's like, you know, it's like there's something about us as South Africans, we like tenacious, you know, we, we don't conform to what they think is going to happen. And that's who we are or who we should be as Christians, you know. The, the doctor will say something, the psychologist will say something, the teacher will say something, but inside is, <laughs> like, you don't know, you don't, uh, you, if you colored, you say, you don't know me. <laughs> but that's how we should be. Why do we conform to what their med medicinal journals say about us when it's so clear what God's Word says about us and what the cross says about us? And so whatever area in your life this evening that does not, not look like victory, <laughs> not, <laughs> not, be not. Whatever area in your life that does not look like victory can be changed. Pain or sickness that you experience in your body is not your portion. It's not your inheritance, no matter what anyone has told you. The reality of the cross wasn't just available 2,000 years ago. It's available today. It's available now. Jesus' work on the cross to heal, to redeem, to save, and to deliver, and to overcome every enemy of mankind is as relevant, as prevalent as it was then. It's like you could say, he just died right now. It's still fresh, you know, it's still, it's still in the air, it's still working. The blood, the cross hasn't lost its power. It hasn't run out. It's there's enough for every single one of us this evening. And so what I felt in my heart, Caleb, would you mind coming up? We're not gonna take too much time. 
But what I felt the Lord saying is there anyone in the room who has received a specific diagnosis from a doctor or even over a family, like if you received a specific diagnosis, the doctor said, you have this, you have, and I heard this, ADHD, you have diabetes, you will have, or you'll always have pain in your body due to an accident, or you, will, you have asthma. It's a diagnosis that a doctor has spoken over you, or a doctor has written over you because of what they've learned from this world. In Hebrews chapter 12, verse 24, it says, the blood speaks a better word. The cross speaks a better word. And so whatever has been diagnosed over you, God takes the eraser and He writes, healed. Asthma rubs it out healed. ADHD rubs it out. He writes healed. He speaks a better word. This is the reality that, that, he, that he speaks over us. That word better means a stronger, more excellent word. And the, I love it. It's the idea that it paints. If, if you get back in the old days when like nations would fight with one another and a kingdom would conquer another kingdom, once they've defeated that enemy, they would take their flag and they would plant their flag over that nation and say, this is our territory, we have conquered. That's actually what's, what they're saying here in, in, in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 24. When the blood speaks a better word, regardless of what that nation was or what that enemy was that was tormenting you or tormenting your family, maybe it is cancer, the, the second, I'm in line for the second generation, you know, or that, that kind of thinking, what has been spoken over you, what the world, what doctors, like I said, teachers, psychologists, family have spoken over you. When God comes in, He eradicates the enemy and He plants a flag of authority and He says, this is now my territory. You belong to me and you belong to me alone. And I say, it is finished on the cross. Whatever the diagnosis was, however severe or unsevere you may think it is, you do not have to tolerate it. And right now, there is freedom and there is healing. And so for those specific things, and if there's any other diagnosis that you've had, I'm just gonna ask you to come forward. I'm not gonna give you the mic and so we can hear your diagnosis. But I'm gonna ask Joshua, Pastor Craig, you can come to you if you'd like to. But we're just gonna lay hands on you and we're gonna come into agreement with you. We're gonna come into agreement with the cross, with the blood of Jesus Christ, regardless of what the diagnosis is, Jesus says over you, by His stripes, you are healed. Don't you wanna bless the Lord for... I'm going to take up the, the offering quickly. Your favorite time of the meeting. Amen. Because you're the most cheerful during this time of the message. Amen. That's what the word says. But uh, I, I'm not going to take up too much time because we're over time. But I want to, I want to leave you with this um, in line with what Lloyd was sharing tonight about um, there's this amazing thing with grace that there's nothing that you can do with the power of your will that can add to heaven. And yet, grace only empowers your life by your will. And so when we make a decision of intentionality for God to intervene into something, um, when we make a decision to believe Him at His Word, when we make a decision to change things according to what His Word says, then His grace empowers us to keep us. Amen. And so when it comes on the matter of finances, I know I've been talking a lot about jobs and I've been talking about the workplace and I've been talking about your destiny in Christ Jesus and I've been talking about that your boss is not your source. And... I want to read you a, 
rough scripture from Jeremiah chapter 17, verse 5. And it says this. It says, Cursed is the man who trusts in man and who makes flesh his strength, whose heart turns away from the Lord. He's like a shrub in the desert and shall not see any good come. He shall dwell in parched places of the wilderness in an uninhabited salt land. Now for context purposes, he's talking about Israel trusting in man and the strength of themselves, but we can apply this to our lives and our bosses. We're not to trust our boss, amen. We don't trust in him. He's not our source of provision, God is. And and you say, well, he's paying my, yes, I understand the, the anatomy of it and the transactions are happening like that and, and it's getting deposited into your account. But it's about where's your will aligned and what have you chosen to believe? When we make a decision and we say that God is my source of provision because of what Jesus said, God is my source because it says in His Word that He was made poor so that through Christ Jesus, I could be made rich. Why does He say that? A prosperity preacher never wrote that. Paul did. The one who learned to be a base and to abound, the one who was shipwrecked and beaten, he wrote that. Amen. So here's the good news. Blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord, whose trust is in the Lord. He's like a tree planted by water that sends out its roots by the stream and does not fear when the heat comes, for its leaves remain green. It is not anxious in the year of drought, for it does not cease to bear fruit. We may as well keep going because it's so good. The heart is deceitful above all things. Don't listen to your heart. Listen to the Lord. And desperately sick, who can understand it? There's one who does understand it. I, the Lord, search the heart and test the mind to give every man according to his ways, according to the fruit of his deeds. Sticking with the Old Testament in Psalm 27, I believe verse 13, that I will look on the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. And for those of you that are in financial dire straits, you're hanging on to a bolting horse. This is for you. Wait for the Lord. Be strong and let your heart take courage. Wait for the Lord. He never forsakes his word and he never forsakes his people. And if you make the decision that the word of God is the first and final authority in my life and I'm going to live according to biblical standards, he will keep you. Even in the year of famine, you need not be anxious for you will bear fruit. Amen. I was, I'll share a testimony quickly about Todd White who ran out of money. And his wife was very frustrated that the Lord had put them in this position of running out of money when he, they're doing so much for God. And Todd was sharing about his wife was more frustrated with him because he was so excited. And she's asking him, what are you happy about? And he's saying, you don't understand. When we have nothing, it means God's going to do something. And we're about to see him do something. And it's hard when you don't have to have that spirit of faith. But when you're rooted in him and in his word, and you know that he never forgets his promises, then you are able to count it all joy when you fall into a trial because you know you're about to see what God is going to do. Amen. Thanks for watching. We trust this word takes root in your heart. To stay in touch, visit the website linked below. We'd love to have you join in person soon. Be sure to visit us in Durban, South Africa or Charleston, USA. Have a blessed week.